Welcome everybody to this special presentation from WHAS 11 News Tornado, April 3rd, 1974, now 50 years later. I'm Doug Prophet, and I'm joined along with WHAS TV's Joe Federley. Joe, how are you tonight? Good, how are you doing? Very good. Joe is our chief archivist here at WHAS 11 and part-time historian, and he has been diving into the old film reels. Joe, April 3rd, 1974, I was a kid. Mm -hmm. I remember getting off the school bus, the got us home early, racing, the sky look, looking just mm -hmm. awful, running into the house, and WHAS TV was on. Ken Rowland, the anchor, was already on the air, uh, and April 3rd, 1974 is a day I'll never forget, and you find most people in Kentuckyana about my age say the same thing. Right. Now, you were able to get us still. WHAS was on the air at your house. We never lost, we never lost power, but I've since learned from our folks who worked here so many years mm -hmm. that they turned on the backup generator the minute the tornado reports were coming in just in case, and that kept WHAS TV and radio on the air. We never lost mm -hmm. power. It became such an important voice for saving right. lives. Well, the very first part of this special you're going to see is Dick Gilbert. He was in the helicopter, and he followed it, and he was telling everybody. He was on HHS radio and television, right? And he was telling everybody where it was going. Uh, the very first part, Ken Rowland, he anchors the special. It's an hour-long special. It aired shortly after the tornado happened, and Ken Rowland says it, Dick Gilbert saved a lot of people's lives because he was able to warn people of, that it's coming your way. Hurry up and take cover now because he saw it happening. Now, this is an interesting special because, as you'll notice, it's on film, which is what I'm holding, one of these old film reels right here. Uh, and Ken explains, and Ken has, is now deceased, uh, but we did interview him many times over the years. He was a lovely man, and I enjoyed talking to him about his stories because his Delivery was so calm and so matter of fact. He never cracked. He never broke. Right. Even though he was telling people things like, the Louisville Water Company has been hit. You can't use right. the water anymore. We've never had a disaster like that. And Joey also says in this special, the reason why they're doing this special mm -hmm. is because they right. got so much mail from people who mm -hmm. didn't see Channel 11 after the power outages hit. Right, he says that. There's so many people. He reads this one letter from this lady who says she couldn't watch it. She would have wanted to have watched it, but she doesn't want to turn into somebody who just drives past the houses to look and gawk. So that's what that's the reason why they produced this, so people could see all the coverage that we did. And this is from April 3rd and the day after. You see film from April 4th as well, because really it took so much time to see everything that had happened, you know. So we're getting ready to show it to you, but one other thing I think you'd find interesting, since everything was on film, that means it had to be developed. We had film processors in this building at Six and Chestnut. The photographers who appear on the set with Ken Rowland right. would run back to the station. They would do a fast development. Uh, they had a term for it back then, but they could get the film out immediately mm -hmm. and get it on the air when it was hot and the photographers would narrate their own film. Burt Broman was the first one who came. He was in the helicopter with Dick Gilbert, and he's the first one you're going to hear about on the set. And, uh, I mean, I like what he said. Dick Gilbert asked him, are you, gonna, are you ready to see what you're about to see? He said, yeah, but later on he said he wasn't because it was so much destruction. Well, the key is if they didn't preserve that film right away after mm -hmm. they ran it hot, you lost it. But here at WHAS, they preserved the film. Thank right. goodness they did, or we yeah. wouldn't have anything left. And so take a look. Here is the special produced by WHAS TV right after the April 3rd, 1974 tornado. Then it came across Eastern Parkway and Bargetown Road. It went roaring through the uh, Seneca Cherokee Park area, absolutely denuding a portion of that park. There's no trees left. There's nothing but splintered stumps in there for, uh, oh, I, I can't estimate how many acres are involved. Then it came right between Barrett Junior High School on Grinstead Drive and the Baptist Theological Seminary. It crossed Grinstead Drive right there, leaving this wide swath of total uh, destruction. It came uh, over Pennsylvania Avenue. Well, let's come on up. Stilts and Frankfurt, Pennsylvania, Hillcrest, right there at the Frankfurt Avenue intersection. It's completely wiped out. All, every house is damaged to some extent. Then it came across the Crescent Hill Golf Club, and I'm over Indian Hills right now, and uh, I, can't, I can't even begin to count. I would guess 200 homes out here have the, uh, at least the second floor gone. Many of them are completely demolished, and uh, most of them are, uh, the walls are askew, the roof is uh, sagging, and so forth. Trees have been chopped down all the way. 
now I'm curving around and following the path of it. It seems to have turned a little bit then toward the east. And uh, this is over the Zachary Taylor area, just south, I'm sorry, just north of Zachary Taylor Monument. It cut a swath through this area, again, taking the roof and in many cases the second floor off the uh, houses in this area. And then it crossed the Waterson near I-71, just beyond this point, I believe. I'm not sure because I'm still a mile away, but I think this is about the tail end of the worst damage here. This seems to be about where it started lifting and dissipating. That's the way it looks from here. Dick Gilbert, Skywatch 84. In at least one way, April 3, 1974 has taken its place beside December 7, 1941 and November 22, 1963. Years from now, if anyone asks you about April 3rd, 1974, and if you're from this area, you'll be able to tell them exactly where you were and what you were doing when the tornado struck. At Channel 11, it was naturally a very busy time for us, but it wasn't until days later, when the mail started coming in, that we fully realized how many thousands of people did not see any of our coverage. Here's a typical letter from Mrs. Catherine Lynette of 1601 Newburgh Road. She said, would it be possible for you to rerun the tornado newsreels that you had on April 3rd, 4th, and 5th, or later? Those of us who are victims had no power at the first showing, and we've been much too busy ever since to see the tornado coverage that you had. However, she said, I will miss it before I become a gawker. That's the purpose of this program. If you did miss our coverage on April 3rd and April 4th, here are excerpts of that coverage. Good evening. Metropolitan Louisville and southern Indiana have been hit hard by tornadoes. There are as yet no reports of deaths from the tornadoes that struck Louisville and eastern Jefferson County late this afternoon, but the Indiana State Police report that in Indiana at least 11 persons were killed as a result of tornadoes that touched down in at least half a dozen southern Indiana communities. In Kentucky, Jefferson County Police called in off-duty personnel to handle the situation in the eastern part of the county, where subdivisions around the Watterson Expressway and I-71 were heavily damaged. This WHAS-TV news special is sponsored by the Courier-Journal and the Louisville Times. The high winds have knocked out the power at the Louisville Water Company's main pumping station at Crescent Hill. The system's chief engineer, Frank Campbell, said it is critical that everyone, both industries and residences, use only the water that is essential. Presently, the company has eight hours of water in the reservoir, but that amount can be stretched to last about a day if everyone curtails usage to only the bare minimum needs. Dick Gilbert was the first person in Louisville to see the devastation that the tornado had inflicted on this large metropolitan area. His helicopter was in the sky when the tornado first hit, and he described it as it went, step by step. Dick Gilbert saved a lot of lives that day. It was his recorded voice that you heard at the opening of this program as he described the devastation when he first saw it. The man who shot the accompanying film was Bert Broman. Bert came to our 6 o'clock news set the moment he stepped out of that helicopter. I'm a little reluctant to say what I saw because I'm afraid of... Uh... I'm afraid I may overemphasize what I saw. I, I, I certainly wouldn't want to panic anybody, but I would say I was mighty surprised what I saw. Dick Gilbert asked me before we went up, he said, are you prepared for this? And I said, sure, sure. But when I saw it, I don't think I was prepared for it. I would say there is a major amount of damage in the Louisville area. I was amazed at the amount of homes that were severely damaged, and I don't mean by that uh, roofs torn off. I mean entire stories of homes are, are uh, taken off, are possibly even completely just level. We assigned Bud Harbsmeyer to the fairgrounds area that night where the tornado first touched down, and his was the first film that we saw that night. We went into Audubon Park as far as we could, which wasn't very far because there were huge trees in Audubon Park, some of them maybe 60, 70 feet high. No more. Most of them uh, that I saw are down, and uh, we're seeing some this film is now. Film I now, hope right. this is mine. Yes, it is. This okay. is your film. All right. This is North Audubon Park that you're seeing here, the entranceway, and I believe this is Greenleaf Road. I didn't see any homes destroyed in this area. However, windows were out all over the place, and you can see the lawn furniture uh, down, trees everywhere. We just we couldn't get around. We were afraid of some of the wires. A lot of wires down. Fire, uh, fire equipment, police vehicles all over the place. Uh, Preston Highway clogged with traffic. Everyone was having trouble moving. 
at this point, it was raining and raining rather hard. Uh, this is a building across the way. I believe it's some, kind of, some sort of manufacturing place. It's 3118 uh, Preston Highway, and it, uh, it had its roof demolished. Uh, it had collapsed. Uh, again, we were, able, we were not able to find out whether anybody had been hurt or not. And here we, we, coming in, uh, we are coming into the fairgrounds complex now. And uh, this is the eastern side of the fairgrounds complex. There you see the uh, little out of focus film there. there. Those are the horse barns, or what's left of the horse barns. As you can see, uh, that one was completely smashed. Panning over now toward where the RV vehicles were parked. And, uh, well, there's some of the damage from, again, from the eastern exposition wing. Uh, the, the, uh, and there's a vehicle. That, that's a, a recreational vehicle. There were perhaps 20 or 30 of them parked in the lot uh, at Freedom Hall. Most of them turned over, thrown up against each other, or suffered debris damage from, uh, from uh, the roofs. That 6 o'clock newscast included a number of severe weather forecasts for other nearby areas. And there were even reports of scattered earth tremors in southern Indiana. It also included a summation of where the tornadoes had hit and where the known fatalities were. Our next special coverage on that night of April 3rd was a special at 7.20 p.m. We'll see it in a moment. When the tornado swept through Louisville, it wasn't over. In fact, there were tornado cells throughout Kentucky and southern Indiana later in the evening. We started our 720 special with a tornado bulletin, and a little later, we interrupted it with a tornado sighting. A pair of tornadoes were indicated by radar at 15 miles south and 10 miles southeast of Standerford Field at 712. They were moving to the east-northeast at 50 miles an hour. This means that they were seen about 10 minutes ago. We repeat, a pair of tornadoes were indicated by radar at 710 p.m., 15 miles south, and 10 miles southeast of Standerford Airport in Louisville. These tornadoes are moving to the east-northeast at 50 miles an hour. If threatening conditions are sighted, be prepared to move to a place of safety. To report a tornado or other severe weather, place an emergency call to the nearest law enforcement agency for relay to the National Weather Service. The police department has just called WHS-TV, speaking for the water company. They say that the water supply in Louisville has fallen to a dangerously low level. This is because of the tornado that went through Louisville late this afternoon, crippling the water company uh, 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 operation in the uh, Crescent Hill area. So you're asked, please do not use water. Please do not use water now until the water supply can build itself up again, because right now it has fallen to a dangerously low level. Please do not use water here in the city of Louisville. John Petrovich has been out in the area. We haven't really had time to talk to him ourselves, ladies and gentlemen. So uh, what I find out from him right now is well, what you're finding out. But uh, John has been in the hardest hit areas in St. Matthews and in the Crescent Hill area and in northeastern Jefferson County. John, uh, what do you know? Well, I've been out into the field two and a half hours and uh, from the ground, and not from the air, but from the ground, it's, it's sure tragedy in some of the six-class cities and some of the subdivisions. Starting with the farthest point east, we have Northfield, the city of Northfield, which is uh, bounded by I-71. Alone in that subdivision, cameraman Kerwin Fisher and I counted 40 homes leveled, brand new homes that were These are expensive homes in that I-71 and Waterson right, Expressway right. area, aren't they? P pieces, pieces of homes were lying on the interstate, shingles, roofs, walls were caved in, uh, bedroom clothing, furniture was scattered all over. People were combing through their wreckage. People were coming into their homes from work. No injuries in that area. When we were in there, people were helping one another. Firemen from the various volunteer fire departments were going from door to door. St. Matthew's police departments were going from door to door. As we proceeded towards town, again, the same story in other cities and other subdivisions. Roll, uh, uh, Indian Hills, again, yeah, following the dip, following the curvature of how the tornado came, you have the same problem. 
homes leveled, flattened, partly destroyed. The Ruth Dunn Elementary School, which is uh, off I-71 and Brownsboro Road, was partially destroyed. Walls were caved in. Going further down into Indian Hills, again, the same story. Subdivisions partially lost. Uh, pardon me for interrupting you, John. A funnel cloud has been sighted moving northeast from McNeely Lake. That is out in southern, extreme southern, southeastern Jefferson County. A funnel cloud has been sighted moving northeast from McNeely Lake. Please be on guard in those areas and, if necessary, take a place of safety in a basement or wherever you can. A funnel cloud has been sighted moving northeast from McNeely Lake. This is just moments ago. Two, two late developments that happened while we were leaving. First of all, county police have set up barricades and blockades off of Brownsboro Road, the Indian Hill area, the Northfield area, to prevent looters from coming into the area. There were reports that looters were going into the area. Police blockades have been set up in that area to keep people away. Fire departments are going around and turning off gas lines. You can literally hear the gas coming from the ground in some of these homes. Very volatile situation, keeping them away from there. We talked to Dr. Donald Thomas from General Hospital, who was manning one of the emergency centers on Pennington and Brownsboro Road at the Second Presbyterian Church. He told us 30 minutes ago that General Hospital had 40 people in their room. One was serious in the operating room. And as of now, in terms of death count, he knew of two people that were killed because of the tornado. Uh, that is at General, or does he mean uh, citywide? Citywide. All right. Citywide. And he has no contact with suburban hospital or other hospitals. There is no communication. But from what he is told, suburban is chock full of people from injuries. Right, and other hospitals are, right. are too. Uh, do you know whether any deaths came from that area that you're talking about uh, at uh, I-71 and no. the... Uh, no. From looking at it, there should have been. Right. From looking at it. Now, US-42 and Chenoweth Lane, were you in that area? No. All right, it was hit pretty hard. Right, and you were t that's in strictly Indian Hills, Mockingbird right. in that area. That right. was, uh, in terms of total devastation, it was included into what we saw and we could see when you're looking over on the hills from subdivision to subdivision, you can see flattened homes or partially destroyed homes. Second floor is gone. People walking around combing through the ru rubbish saying they were lucky. The people were calm, surprisingly. No mass hysteria. They're just walking around and trying to recover and recoup what they've lost. This is one of the worst things, I believe, since Topeka, Kansas, uh, many years ago, as far as a metropolitan area is concerned. And, of course, Cincinnati was hit. I mean, you know, it's, it's just uh, almost unbelievable, the area that this is hit. The mobilization's unbelievable. Uh, for an hour, all you could hear were sirens off of I-71, constant shrill and, as people walked to and from their house. John, uh, we're planning a special at 9 o'clock. I mean, that's our plan now. And, of course, you'll be back with us then. And we'll uh, have film. With report of, and the film of uh, what John has seen will be on at that time. Uh, as we've said, a murderous battery of tornadoes has smashed into wide sections of the South and the Midwest today, killing more than 20 people, causing extensive damage and injuries, and many of uh, those injuries and a great deal of that damage has been right here in Louisville and Jefferson County and across the river in Clark and Floyd counties, up at uh, Madison, Indiana, up in the Seymour and Brownstown area, and uh, others. Uh, the National Guard has been called to duty in the stricken areas, and in Indiana, a spokesman at National Guard headquarters in Indianapolis said that the National Guard is assembling in Indiana at six armories, their New Albany, Madison, Salem, Seymour, North Vernon, and Monticello. In case you didn't hear us before or just tuned in, uh, there was a tornado cloud a funnel was uh, spotted near McNeely Lake just a few minutes ago, and it was moving northeast. And if you live in that area, please be on guard. Also, a bulletin had come in of a tornado warning being in effect until 8.15 tonight. That would be for the next 45 minutes for persons living in Jefferson, Bullitt, Oldham, Henry, Shelby, and Spencer counties. A pair of tornadoes indicated by radar at 7.10, at 15 miles south and 10 miles southeast of Standerford Field in Louisville. These tornadoes would be moving to the east-northeast at 50 miles an hour. It would probably be this cell that caused that funnel cloud that we reported just a few minutes ago in the McNeely Lake area. Uh, it would perhaps be in that cell. Uh, that's all that we can tell you right now. Also, that the police department has asked that no one use any water. The Louisville water supply has fallen to a dangerously low level. The police department, speaking for the Louisville Water Company, said do not use water at this particular time in Louisville and Jefferson County, please. 
Uh, Bert Broman is uh, here with me, and uh, Bert, of course, was on our 6 o'clock news. You perhaps saw him at that time. Bert was up in a helicopter and saw most of the damage uh, from the air. And Bert, I understand that we have some film. Uh, is there anything you want to say before we start this film? No, I think the film will pretty well explain itself. All right. Uh, if we can roll that film, and Bert will tell us where we are. This is, uh, this is Seneca Park area, I believe. You might be able to see better on that big monitor, Bert. You know, if you'll notice, uh, most of the damage, the, the debris from the damage, uh, is lying all, all in one direction. The trees all lying like uh, sticks laid out, like pickup sticks. Uh, this is going northeast through Crescent Hill now, northeast right? Northeast through Crescent Hill, right. Uh, the, the damage uh, I thought was bad here. When I first saw this, I was, I was really surprised. I couldn't imagine that it had done this much damage over this wide an area. But uh, unfortunately, it got worse as we went. There was a definite pattern starting at Crescent Hill out to the Indian Hills area. Uh, the, the, uh, the pattern of damage definitely got, got much worse the further we went. This is still, I think, the, the, generally the Crescent Hill area. Mm -hmm. Roofs torn off, um, trees toppled, power lines down. Now, this is the water company. I'm sorry we, ch we changed shots. This there. is the reason we don't have any water, because it was damaged. And, and this film is only about well. an hour and a half old, and we really didn't right. have time to edit it properly, but uh, it, I think it gets the point across. Uh, I would only remind people uh, in the areas of any possible tornadoes at this point, for heaven's sakes, take it seriously. Uh, after seeing this film and seeing what I saw a few hours ago, uh, I know I'll certainly take it more seriously from now on. It always happens someplace else, and tonight it happened in Louisville. I, Where I are we headed now? I can't to, place, toward the Indian Hills area? Yeah, I can't place it exactly, but it is out in the uh, far eastern part of the city, and I think you can see uh, one by the lack, gone, by the totally lack of houses, yeah, and the amount of debris, that the damage is worse. And the further you go, as I say, the, the worse it gets. Some of the homes damaged, uh, I understand, were uh, in brand new subdivisions and very, very expensive uh, brick homes. Uh, these weren't uh, <clears throat> these weren't a bunch of frame homes uh, or inexpensive. There's a power line down. There are uh, power lines down in a great many areas of the county, and they're high voltage lines too. Go ahead. Uh, I, this is getting out more toward the Indian Hills area. People on the streets, uh, not, not panic, but, but uh, seem to be bewildered. They didn't know quite what had happened. Here you can see the amount of debris. And, and uh, to do that much destruction, there had, it just had to be a tremendous force. And it, as you notice, uh, the further you go, the worse it gets. Trees just denuded and uh, yeah, snap, debris. Snapped right off at the ground line, just, just like uh, they were nothing. Uh, it, it reminded me, the whole time I was photographing the thing, I kept having these visions of uh, like a public service announcement of uh, some disaster in India or something, and it was kind of hard to realize that this was, this was Louisville, Kentucky. This is the North, North Hill, I believe, near I-71 and the yes. Washington Expressway. Yes. These are all new homes in there, and that, that is the film that we have uh, at the present time. Anything else, Bert? No, I think we'll have some more film later in... Uh, uh, I think the film speaks for itself. We plan that special now at uh, 9 o'clock, and of course uh, we'll be seeing you then and, uh, and have it in a more compact, uh, perhaps a more intelligible way, but you did a wonderful job on it, uh, just getting the film just out of the processor and uh, putting on. We'll take a look at excerpts from that 9 o'clock special in just a moment. At 9 o'clock on the night of April 3rd, WHES-TV presented a 40-minute special trying to wrap up everything that had happened. Here are a few excerpts. This is the Northfield film, uh, which is I-71 and the Watterson Expressway. Beautiful new homes, expensive homes in this subdivision there, only a few years old, some of them brand new, and this is the scene now. Scores of homes in some of the city's most luxurious neighborhoods north of the city were destroyed, as you see, northeast. The tornado cut a path through the Mockingbird Valley area, through Rolling Hills, then Indian Hills, a little girl carrying her dog. In the wake of the Twisters, reports, I'm sorry to say, tonight of looting. The National Guard has been called to patrol this area, the Northfield subdivision. 
Bulldozers were also called in tonight to clear the way for emergency and rescue police. People were reported trapped in their homes. An emergency command post is set up in the area of Brownsboro Road and Chenoweth Lane tonight. They think they have the people out of the homes, but they're not sure. This is the Crescent Hill area, one of the city's oldest, a neighborhood of old homes, old trees, also devastated by the storm. Crescent Hill is also the location of the Louisville Water Company's main processing and pumping station. And while the water plant apparently was not damaged itself structurally, the electric power substation that serves the area was completely knocked out. LG&E says it will be early tomorrow morning before power to the water company can be restored. In the meantime, residents of Louisville and Jefferson County are urged to conserve water, please. This is all in the Crescent Hill section of Louisville. As we said, there are five known deaths in Louisville and Jefferson County. We're under a curfew, a general curfew, in uh, Louisville and Jefferson County until 6 a.m. tomorrow. And we urge you to conserve water because of the low water pressure caused by the lack of electricity there at the power plant. John Petrovich uh, was in the Northfield area, which you saw the new homes there, the most devastated that we have seen in just about any tornado film. John is here in the studio with us now. John? John is, uh, first of all, before, before we go to John to interview him to see what he actually saw, we assigned him to Northfield, and he has this report on film. John? This is the city of Northfield, the last major subdivision to be hit as a tornado moved across East Jefferson County, first touching down in Crescent Hill, Indian Hill, and Rolling Field subdivisions. From the junction of Interstate 71 and the Watterson Expressway, all you could see were partial shells and scattered debris. Inside the subdivision, off-duty St. Matthews police officer James Burton was frantically running from house to house, checking to see if people were trapped. On Stanny Drive, one block over, county police and volunteer firemen were doing the same. Most of the residents were coming into the area from work or from shopping, as Diane Harrison, who had just returned from the Oxmoor Shopping Center. She saw her leveled home when we did. I just drove up about 15, 20 minutes ago. Where's your house? This one right is? there. <laughs> right there. It was right there. Are you all right? Yeah, we were fine. <laughs> Where were you when this happened? I went down in the basement. I saw it coming. I saw the gray clouds coming across, and the, I saw the trees falling one by one until it finally got to us. I went in the, into the basement and hid behind a cabinet. The only sound coming from the area were sirens as police converged into the area, again in search for the injured. Off Brownsboro Road in Lime Town, roadblocks were being set up to keep looters and gawkers away from the area. Lieutenant Richard Carlevelis was giving his men the order for the night watch. Take your stretcher car and use it through you two. All three of you. You take him over to 40, I mean to Lime Kill and 71. Set up right there with your position. Don't let anybody into that area. Heading towards the city, Brownsboro Road was blocked as work crews tried to remove trees from the street. Halfway between Crescent Hill and the Watterson Expressway, an emergency hospital was set up at a church, and emergency vehicles and helicopters were shuttling the injured to hospitals. The chief of the emergency room at General, Dr. Donald Thomas, explained what they were doing, and he also talked about the injury and death count getting worse as the night went we've on. we set up an uh, emergency field hospital here. Fortunately, we've not had very many injured. I have both county uh, paramedic units here with me, and. Uh, about four doctors and six, seven nurses and plenty of medical supplies. We've had five individuals uh, injured up here, two of whom uh, were evacuated to hospitals, but uh, their injuries are really not serious. Uh, lacerations from flying glass and so on. Do you expect the count to get worse as time goes on with some of the wreckage? Uh, it very well may. We have no idea what's going on uh, underneath these buildings, who might be in them and so on. It's going to take a long time to go through them. 
we've made, I've had the fire department and police departments make a cursory search going through shouting and hollering and so forth and seeing if they get any answer, but we really won't know until they really get a chance to get excavate that rubble and see who's under there. Descriptively, it's hard to talk about the destruction where the tornado touched down. Homes were leveled or partially destroyed. And overall, the pattern was one long strip of ruination, and from hilltops, one could see areas untouched, surrounded by debris from other homes that once stood. John Petrovich, TV 11 News. As we said, John is in the studio with us. Uh, he is the one who took that film and uh, reported on it. And uh, John, is there anything you can add? No, the film descriptively tells you what happened. From the air, it was a disaster. From the ground, it was a tragedy because the one-on-one -on -one situation, looking at people going back into the ruins. Mrs. Harrison, when I was talking to her, she, she came into the area looking at her home for the first time. Shortly thereafter, her husband was in the bedroom and, and the front wall had collapsed and you can see him pulling, pulling his clothes from the closet. And I yelled out, good luck. And he yelled back, we're lucky. And essentially, that was the kind of an air that was presented. People felt that lives were saved in this one area. How many, we don't know, but how many could have been lost is, you know, something that should be told. And there was a sense of luckiness from all the people in there. And descriptively, when you see commodes hanging out of a plush home like you talked about earlier, past tense, no longer do you have that. It was quite a tragedy. Do you think that uh, uh, there could be anyone still trapped out there in the devastation that you saw? Right when it happened, emergency people got into the area, and they were literally running from door to door, volunteer firemen, police units from St. Matthew and the county. They were knocking on doors, they were cross-checking with neighbors and saying, do you know of anyone in this house? Did he leave? Did he escape? Where is he right now? So through the cross-checks, I, I would say no. But as you heard, Dr. Thomas said, we won't know until we've literally lifted the ruin. As uh, we said earlier, uh, John, there was some looting out there earlier this evening. At, at 6.15 tonight, as you saw those police cars moving into the Lime Cowan Brownsboro Road area, there were about 20 patrol cars on a Code 3, and that was the purpose, to set up the blockades to keep people from coming into the area, specifically the, uh, the area, the Northfield area, the Indian Hills area. How successful they are, apparently, I don't know, but from reports we're receiving from police monitors, there are looters into that area. Well, there is a curfew out, a general countywide curfew until 6 a.m. in the morning, and uh, I would strongly suggest that there be no one in these affected areas unless you have good business to be there. John, thank you very, very much. Thank you. The total injured and taken to Louisville hospitals that we have been able to find at this moment, 220 here in Louisville. General reports injuries are still being brought in. St. Joseph's Infirmary also is receiving a number of emergency cases there. Of the 220, only about 25 are listed in serious or worse condition. The hospitals are so busy, they don't really know who has been admitted. As we said, there are five reported dead in Jefferson County. We do not have those names. They are at General Hospital. Another one of our photographers who has spent a very busy day today is Ken Durham. Ken, I haven't had time to talk to you, as you know, until you just came out here to the studio, even though you were scheduled to be on this uh, special yes. tonight. Ken, where did you take film tonight? Uh, the film I shot was along Frankfurt Avenue between Crescent Court and Reservoir Avenue. And uh, the tornado took a, came across at an angle from Grinstead Drive right up through Crescent Court across Frankfurt Avenue, down Pennsylvania and Hillcrest, and over towards Brownsboro Road, across the Crescent Hill Golf Course and the Louisville Waterworks. Now, you have film of this? Yes, I do have film well, of this. Well, if the film is ready, let's roll it, and you describe it. And if I see anything I want to ask questions about, we will. Here we go. This is the water company right here. That's the transmitter they were talking about having been knocked out. This is just the general scene along Frankfurt Avenue facing toward the west. That's the flagpole in front of the water company. It got completely bent over. The flag is in tatters. Several windows were blown out of the filtration plant. Uh, I do not know what the damage was inside, but it, uh, it was hard to tell. The windows were all out. There was no structural damage as such as up to this small building here and this building along the reservoir. There, there were several holes in the roof and windows were also blown out, as you can see. The water company was damaged then structurally too, uh, as well as getting all its uh, electricity knocked out. Yes, it was. There were, as I say, there were windows out and there was damage to the roof and possibly uh, to several of the, the, the retaining walls. This is another shot of the waterworks along Frankfurt Avenue right here. 
Now, on the siding, there was a railroad car that had been completely flipped over. This was right by the waterworks also, so the wind must have been uh, terrifically strong. This is the general devastation along the railroad tracks, the north side of the railroad tracks along Frankfurt Avenue. This is a supermarket that had its front windows blown out and poles were blown down along the street. Just the, the whole area was completely torn apart. People seemed to be in a, in a state of shock. They didn't really know what to do. They just stood watching and they, it was hard to comprehend the, the, the disaster. Cars were flipped over. As you can see here, one tree landed on this one and just crunched it. This, this person's not looting. He's trying to uh, save his own property, I believe. He was yelling to someone back in the house to, you know, please get this stuff out before someone runs off with it. That's one of the uh, Air National Guard, or not Air National Guard, but one of the uh, Army helicopters is checking the damage. Where's Garrett's market? Do you that know? is Frankfurt Avenue and Stilts. The lights were not completely down. Power was, of course, off. Mm. This is the house on stilts right across from the water company, right next to Frankfurt Avenue. It's just blown completely down. These two men apparently live there and just can't comprehend what has happened. They don't know what they're going to do. This is also the same area. Most of the cars, it seems, uh, they, besides being turned over, it seemed that the windows had been broken apparently by flying objects, I would, I would assume. But uh, the glass was out of all of them. They're, they were just, just flattened like someone had you know, stepped on them or flipped over like this car was. That's the railroad tracks again right. in the same general area. Right. And these cars apparently were driving down Frankfurt Avenue when it hit and spun around. This woman had a baby in her arms. She was walking down the railroad track. Just, I don't know if she knew where she was going or not. Most, or a lot of the houses had uh, just walls torn out like this one right here, or roofs torn off. They weren't completely flattened as they were out further along Brownsboro Road. But they were damaged quite heavily. A lot of trees were torn down, too. There's, the, the, the streets were impassable. Hillcrest, Pennsylvania, Stilts, Crescent Court. This car was turned over and just crushed on the, from the top, as you can see. Pieces of clothing and pieces of metal scrap were up in the trees, as you can see the top of that tree. And people, as I say, they just, they just couldn't comprehend it. They were standing on their front porch just looking like, you know, what, what, what do we do now? These people were, had already begun to clean up, even. Ken, how many square blocks would you say that this uh, covers in that area where you took film? I would say that it was uh, between Brownsboro and Frankfurt, about three, four square blocks. Just in this one general area, the tornado came across Green State Drive, as I said before, but uh, I didn't see any damage over there. I wasn't in that area. But the, the, the devastation was, was tremendous in that area. I just, I just couldn't believe that uh, this had happened here. Always happened someplace else. Right, and then here, this time it did happen here, and it's, it, it's, it's terrible. Ken, thank you very much. Ken Durham, a fellow you don't see on the air very often, but uh, he did a wonderful job of taking that film and reporting on it tonight. We apologize for the misspelling of Crescent Hill, which you may have noticed. We'll have more aerial films of the Louisville damage and a telephone call from Brandenburg, all from that 9 o'clock special on the night of April 3rd, in just a moment. Bert Broman was in the skies shortly after the tornado hit in the helicopter, and Bert uh, has been with us several times during the evening to explain what he saw. Uh, we have uh, some film, uh, once again, of what Bert saw, and uh, Bert, we're going to roll that film and you describe what you saw from the air. What area is the, uh, this is the trailer park in uh, <clears throat> adjacent to the Twilight Drive-In on Crittenden Drive. Uh, this, this film, by the way, was shot at about 5.30. I guess it was some of the very first, there's the drive-in, some of the first film uh, uh, after, the, uh, after the tornado passed through the area. There didn't seem to be much panic from what we could observe from low altitude. I think at that point the people, uh, the people that we saw didn't, hadn't really registered with them exactly what had happened. The fairgrounds, of course, the main building, and this is the east wing. Uh, it was the, the roof on the east wing just just stripped completely off, as though there had never been a roof there. It's kind of like a model airplane without any paper on it. This is what used to be the horse barn area. I'm sure people are familiar with. Ottoman Park. You'll notice as the film progresses from Crittenden Drive to out in the Indian Hills area, the damage gets. Uh, worse and worse it seems as as you go the uh, the winds seem to uh, cut a path uh, kind of a curving path uh, 
Crescent Hill area here. Damage gets uh, superficial damage in Crescent Hill. Uh, at the lower end of Crescent Hill, uh, roofs torn off, windows uh, out, power lines down. But uh, <clears throat> by the time you get to the eastern part of Crescent Hill, the damage gets uh, considerably worse. Here you can see some walls out of some buildings and so on. It's getting closer to the water company and in that area, right? Right, right. The water company, we noticed uh, at least one building I can recall was completely demolished uh, out close to Frankfurt Avenue. Uh, I didn't see uh, any great deal of damage to the water company buildings themselves, uh, but there were obvious power lines down in the area. Well, we this, had is out, earlier up there. Yeah. this is out further, uh, getting out, I believe, close to the Indian Hills area, and you can tell by uh, <clears throat> the pictures, the fewer houses and the more debris, you can tell it did a lot more damage uh, out in this area, and as you said before, um, these are not little frame homes. Uh, these are very substantial, big, heavy brick homes, some of them in, in almost brand new subdivisions, and uh, either like this with the uh, roofs or second stories torn off, and some of them just completely demolished. There's just nothing there but a pile of junk. What road was that? Do you have any idea? No, I'm sorry, I don't. I can't tell you exactly where we are here. Uh, Trees are all gone. I zoomed the camera in closer here to show some of the detail of the destruction. It was just unbelievable. And it and it's, it seemed to just go on forever and ever. This is square miles, isn't it? Yeah, it, it really is. It's, it's amazing how many homes are involved, what we're talking about here. Uh, uh, I, I would say major damage to at least, at least 200 homes and probably more. <coughs> you ever covered anything like this before? <clears throat> yeah, I have. I've shot uh, plane crashes and floods a few years back in East Kentucky that were pretty extensive. Uh, and I have to say, uh, I have never seen anything quite like this. Well, as far as damage, of course, I, I guess that perhaps, be, being the metropolitan area, the damage is more severe here, perhaps, uh, total monetary damage. We've only had five deaths. However, Brandenburg, Kentucky has been the most severely hit of any place in the uh, state and the toll there seems to be going up by the hour. Uh, Bob Johnson has been on the phone while I've been talking to Bert Broman, and uh, we have uh, someone from Brandenburg on the phone right now. Bob? Ken, I have, uh, it has been destroyed. I have, wait, Jane, just a minute, we're on the air. This is uh, Jane Willis, who is the editor of the Meade County Messenger. Uh, the newspaper in Brandenburg. What is the situation there at this time, Jane? Uh, it is calming down, finally. Uh, much of the place has been, much of the town has been damaged. Uh, How many dead do you have? Pardon? How, How many, many dead? dead? Uh, a state trooper, the last time spoke to me was 24. And how large is Brandenburg? About 1,700 people. Now, can you tell me what happened? Where were you and what did you see? Where was I? <clears throat> My parents and I were in our newspaper office. And my mother said that it's coming, it's coming. Uh, and two of our employees had just left. And she said, get the girls. And we were able to stop them. And they came inside. We all got in the basement stairwell. And at this time, I said, oh, we ought to open a door. And my mother went to the big side door and opened it. And the wind forced her, knocked her through a small space into the basement stairwell. If that hadn't happened, I'm sure the building would have fallen down. Uh, the building next door to us did fall down. None of our family or our employees were hurt. Is the damage largely in the business section of Brandenburg? No, it's all over the town. The, the downtown area is basically demolished. Uh, well, our, okay. uh, there are several buildings that are still standing. Uh, our building is right now, we're, we're here in it. Um, Where were most of the fatalities, Jane? All over, all over the Town. Did you have any kind of warning that this was going to happen, or was it on you so quickly? It just happened very quickly. Uh, I was told that the local radio station said, my lord, there's a tornado coming by. Get the cover quick. 
And uh, at that time, the tornado hit them and broke their tower off. Um, and I understand also that the power facility there has been destroyed? Yes, the rural, uh, the RECC has been largely damaged. Uh, at least half of the building is in, in rubble. No. Uh, I was told one man was killed in that building. Are the emergency facilities adequate there? Do you have all the medical help that you need? Uh, yes, I saw some people that I know from the Fort Knox uh, Ireland Army, the emergency hospital, uh, at our clinic. As far as I know, we, uh, we're being, you know, as adequately taken care of as we can be. Thank you very much, Jane Willis. Okay, thank you. We have been talking with Jane Willis, who is the editor of the Meade County Messenger. Meade County, Brandenburg, hit very hard. Brandenburg, a town southwest of Louisville on the Ohio River. Ken? Shortly after it hit Brandenburg, of course, the same cell hit Louisville and Jefferson County, then northeastern Jefferson County, and on up through the Ohio Valley. Southern Indiana was very hard hit. At least 16 people have been killed in Indiana. Some of those were in northern Indiana, a few in central Indiana, most of them in southern Indiana. Jim West spent the evening after the tornado in uh, southern Indiana, and uh, he has this report, and then we'll talk to him. He has this report from Palmyra. Well, Ken, the tornado hit at mid-afternoon prior to the storm which moved through the Louisville area. The tornado cut a path at least a mile wide from the area of DePauw through Palmyra, then into the Borden and Martinsburg areas. Indiana State Police say the town of Martinsburg was wiped out. 37 homes in the Daisy Hill section of Borden were leveled, killing one person, injuring 41 others. In DePauw, one woman was killed, eight others injured, nine homes and 12 mobile homes destroyed. Here at Palmyra, state police say as many as 70 homes were destroyed. These border US 150, many just a couple of years old. The highway was closed for over an hour with downed wires and trees. Gene Hornsbury was at home with his wife and two children when the tornado struck. And we talked with him moments after it happened. Well, me and my wife saw this uh, cloud start to form back in that direction there, and it started twisting around, so we figured it was a tornado coming. And we stood there at the door and watched it for a while, and it finally uh, got worse. So we hit it around the house and got under the house there, got in this corner right over here, and it lifted the house right off the foundation there, and I thought it was going to take us out with it, too. We were in the crawl space right under the house there, right next to the concrete. Did it lift it right over your heads? Yes, sir, it did. Uh, my wife had a coat in her hand. It jerked the, jerked the coat out of her hand, and uh, I thought we were coming up with it. But we were lucky enough to get by without any injuries. The startling films from other southern Indiana communities and from Brandenburg, Kentucky, were taken the next day. We'll see those in a moment. Bud Harbsmeyer was in Brandenburg when the sun came up the next morning. His report from there was part of a special one-hour newscast at 6 p.m. on April 4th. Brandenburg is a farm community of about 1,700 people. It is located on the Ohio River some 40 miles from Louisville. It is or was rich in historical heritage. Now it is a shambles. Mrs. Mary Jenkins' husband lost his funeral home business and the family lost most of their belongings. I found her in her yard today trying to salvage some of the pieces. I asked her about the storm. When you got out of the basement and looked around, what were your impressions? It was frightening, yes. You keep wondering about people and you could see so many children screaming for mothers and mothers screaming for children and, and we knew that we couldn't get the, my husband's ambulances out because they'd gone over the bluff and we didn't know whether the clinic was gone or whether there was even a doctor in town or not. My own family wasn't hurt. The tornado ripped across high ground overlooking the Ohio River. Then it dipped down onto Main Street. Buildings which had stood for over 120 years now were no longer recognizable. One of the oldest buildings on Main Street was the historic Hotel Mead. It had been constructed in 1840. It had housed Confederate Colonel John Hunt Morgan once during the Civil War. Later in 1869, Frank James and the younger brothers had shot it out with lawmen inside. Now a converted apartment house, it was almost completely destroyed. One of the first policemen on the scene after word of the disaster got out was Muldrow Police Chief D.L. Harris. He told me what he saw when he arrived. Here in town, 
uh, it was pretty clean as far as people. Uh, the people had already got to them. Now, in the outlying areas, uh, I didn't do it myself. A couple men on my department picked people laying up in the middle of fields, uh, under a part of a barn, laying right out in the middle of a field, just laying right out in the open. During the night, police, National Guardsmen, and Army troops from Fort Knox patrolled the devastated areas, but there were no reports of looting. The Army was sent back to Fort Knox today, but police and National Guardsmen will be on hand for an indefinite time. The job of identifying the dead continues, too. Outside of one of the schools in Brandenburg sit two large refrigerated trucks. One contains the bodies of identified victims, the other the remains of the unidentified. The dead range in age from children to the elderly. But even as the townspeople mourn their dead, there is talk of rebuilding. One local newspaper official said, if we have another disaster, it'll have to hit a new town. There's not much left to try to repair. Bud Harbsmeyer, TV 11 News, Brandenburg, Kentucky. Jim West returned to southern Indiana on April the 4th, both by helicopter and by car. It was about 2.30 yesterday afternoon that the tornado moved into the southern Indiana county of Harrison. The twister first touched down in the small communities of Milltown and DePauw. Trailers were overturned, homes and barns flattened. It was in DePauw that 47-year-old Joyce Lincoln suffered fatal injuries. Eight others were injured, around nine homes and 12 trailers destroyed in DePauw. The tornado then moved across eight miles of farmland and in an exact northeasterly direction, came to the town of Palmyra. It was just south of that town that it was joined by a second tornado cutting across its path. Although missing the heart of the town, it did destroy around 70 homes south and east of that Harrison County community. At the Palmyra Conservation Club, rescue and shelter operations were being coordinated. It was in Palmyra that 77-year-old Lily Quiggins lost her life. Homes along US 150 were blown dozens of feet from their foundations. The storm continued to move northeasterly. The small community of Martinsburg only had about 70 or 80 homes, but the tornado did not spare even these. National Guard units, although active at each city where we visited, seemed to guard entrance to Martinsburg the most. Washington County Sheriff Clyde Nichols described the damage. 75 homes that are damaged or destroyed, and this is the hardest hit part of the county. We had a slight touchdown in Camelsburg, and, uh, and a just a small section of Washington County on the Daisy Hill area. It was in Martinsburg that we met up with a helicopter tour of disaster areas by representatives from Indiana Governor Otis Bowen's staff and officials of the Indiana National Guard. The tornado then moved into the northwestern tip of Clark County into the Borden area. It leveled several homes along State Road 60, then devastated the subdivision known as Daisy Hills, killing 73-year-old Harvey Lee Peace and injuring 41 others. We talked with one survivor. I stood and watched three funnel clouds start down to the ground, and they turned and went back up, and then I heard a roar noise, and, and I saw what I thought to be smoke and stuff coming up over the hill, but it was a black cloud or wind, dirt, and everything coming up over the hill. And my little grandson asked me what it was, and I told him I thought it sounded like a train, but I knew it wasn't. And it just hit, and that's it. Another hard-hit area in southern Indiana was around Madison in Jefferson County. At least eight people are dead in the Madison, Hanover, and Chelsea areas. In Hanover, 37-year-old Margaret Lawson, her two-year-old son Mark were both killed. Also in Hanover, Ruth Kingerly and her unidentified child lost their lives. At the 1300 student campus of Hanover College, students by the droves were packing for an early spring vacation. After the tornado ripped through the campus, tearing the top floors off two sorority buildings and felling the trees across campus, college registrar Robert McClue said only two students were slightly injured but the campus will have to close for a couple of weeks. In Madison, an estimated five to 600 homes were affected. Damage was thought to be more than $10 million. The twister severely damaged the Indiana-Kentucky electric Clifty Creek generating plant. Transmission lines were snapped and thrown into the Ohio River. At least 129 people were treated, 19 were admitted. Those fatally injured in Madison were 26-year-old Joan Givenden, five-year-old Angela Givenden, and nine-year-old Dennis Reese, Jr. Jim West, TV 11 News.
Bob Johnson, in the light of day, retraced the tornado's path through Louisville. The trees that once lined Grinstead Drive are gone, and so too are the houses. In the 2700 block of Grinstead, I counted 20 houses in a row that appeared to be damaged beyond repair, their owners picking through what was left. Lillian Elrod lived in this small stucco bungalow at 2769 for 40 years, during the time she taught French and Spanish at Atherton High School. Some of the Baptist Seminary students came down the hill this morning to help. The storm had buckled the walls and taken the roof, but Lillian Elrod's Canton China was right there where she left it yesterday, not a scratch. She'll be moving in with her sister now, but she feels it won't be too hard to leave. Well, not now. <laughs> I'll be glad to leave this shambles. I I'm going to have to say it took a tornado to get me out of my house <laughs> because I really have loved it. And I've enjoyed every minute that I've lived here for all of these years. So um, I feel that I'm blessed, that I have a place to go, that I'm alive. And um, after all, this is material. And uh, the, the material isn't. I see now how unimportant the material is. And uh, it won't be a great sacrifice. Of course, I'm sorry to lose nice things that I can't replace. Up on the hill behind Miss Elrod, students from the University of Louisville Dental School and the Presbyterian Seminary were working to clear the downed trees with Block Kennedy Avenue. A few feet away, someone was flying the flag. If flags are symbols, this one seemed to stand for a gritty kind of optimism among most of the residents of the area. The tornado carried across Crescent Hill, past the waterworks, across Brownsboro Road, where today the only danger appeared to be the steady stream of curiosity seekers who cruised through the devastated area. North of Brownsboro Road, the houses are more expensive, the damage in many instances more complete. In Northfield, Mr. and Mrs. Tom Ernst moved from Illinois only a few months ago. Now their new home is gone. The mailman delivered Mrs. Ernst's Kentucky driver's license this morning, but now her car is gone too. The Ernst spent the night with a neighbor they did not know before the storm. This morning they were trying to salvage a bit of what was left. Like I say, I really don't remember it being this bad yesterday when I shoved the kids out of the window and got out. I, I, I don't, I really don't remember it being this bad. It really hurt me more this morning and made me more sad this morning seeing how it had affected such a large area. Uh, high, it's unbelievable. Tom Ernst's parents were down from Illinois last month to help finish the new house. Last night, they came again in response to a phone call. They said the kids were okay, they lost the house. That was mostly what we were interested in. Hell, we can always get another house, you know. But uh, we got right in the car and came on down and uh, got here at 7 o'clock this morning. Help them get cleaned up a little bit. <laughs> what a mess. What a mess. Well, it'll all work out, I guess. It's just too bad. There's an awful loss here. My, these people, I feel so sorry for them. But I want to say one thing. The neighbors and the people have been outstanding, really outstanding. I've never seen anything like it in my life. You've got a good community here. I wouldn't mind living in it myself. Mr. Ernst is right. This disaster brought out the best in most people. For a while at least, the golden rule became the order of the day. It's strange that a storm that literally tried to blow us apart brought us closer together. There's one thing for sure, though. We don't mind answering our mail by repeating excerpts from our tornado coverage. But like you, we never want to repeat the experience. For the entire Channel 11 news staff, I'm Ken Rowland.
Let's take a close-up of something else Joe found. This is uh, one of the actual scripts of that special. And as you can see, it's typewritten. <laughs> we had IBM Selectrics here and we wrote it all out. <laughs> and here is the, some of the old film, the film canisters there from that, from that time. We really do have a lot to be thankful for because, I mean, they could have just aired that as is and we would have never even seen it again. We, but what's cool is, I mean, I love the people who worked here before us. They thought this is important enough to put on on film and it's been transferred to tape and it's been 50 years later and we still have it. I believe this is the first time anybody's seen this entire hour unedited for the past 50 years. WHAS TV and radio were uh, you know in this building and they combined to do such powerful coverage uh, because the the whole staff was here at the time and the joint staffs together were, were gigantic. Biggest newsroom in the state of Kentucky for television and radio at the time and so the men and women were on the air round the clock. Right. I think you'd find an interesting fallout that happened to them. They all became major recognized personalities mm -hmm. in Louisville. Uh, I asked Ken this. I talked to Byron Crawford about this. Uh, and for Dick Gilbert, Dick Gilbert was a radio news helicopter reporter, and he became so famous because he saved so many lives flying along with the tornado. It was the early Doppler radar. Mm -hmm. He would say, uh, uh, Crescent Hill, here it comes. I, and Dick Gilbert grew up on Pennsylvania Avenue in Crescent mm -hmm. Hill. He knew the streets down below um, because they became so famous. The folks at Channel 11 said, we need a little bit more of Dick Gilbert on the air. And they made him the weekend weather guy on the air with Byron Crawford and Monica Kaufman did our weekend news. So they, they, right. they wanted to uh, capitalize on those big personalities because mm -hmm. of their great award-winning coverage. And you're right, it really was a combination of all the Bingham companies. You saw that it said, presented by Courier Journal Louisville Times. It was a big production. I mean, the Binghams made sure that this was preserved, that everybody saw what was happening. Because they had a heart for the community. They wanted to make sure everything was uh, visible for them to see, even if they didn't have power at the time that it happened. Well, it was, it's hard to believe it was 50 years ago. I was 10 years old. Unbelievable. I mean, I, my father still says he remembers driving on the Watterson Expressway that way, and he didn't understand the brevity of what had happened until he saw Freedom Hall's roof was torn off. And, of course, he saw that in the special. It's amazing. Did you see all the barns? All the barns on the fairgrounds were leveled. There wasn't anything left. Well, just think of, about the changes back then. Uh, you didn't have the early warning system. Louisville right. really didn't have meteorologists on the air. It was the uh, radio ad guys. Uh, who were doing part-time radio, they would come on and do weather. Meteorologists, mm -hmm. in fact, Chuck Taylor, our mm -hmm. famed meteorologist, was hired after April 3rd, 1974. Mm -hmm. And right. so the people were driving along and they were listening to AM radio and there's Dick Gilbert. He was the first early warning system. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, you even see the weatherman on duty at the time, Ray Shelton. He used to do the great financial federal ads. That's right. He, he had, had the microphone on his, they had special microphones back then so they could look at the radar and everything else with both of their hands. They had a cool little microphone system. Well, and, and Tom Wills at Wave told me that the uh, radar back then that they used, it was an old scope that went around. And you know where they got the radar? No. From an old Delta Airlines jet. <laughs> it was a Delta Airlines jet radar. That was that would they, they would zoom in a camera on it so, and they would go around the scope and that would show you if a little mass of a storm was coming in, but nothing like what we have today. Right. Well, shortly after the Ken Schultz and Chuck Taylor, the first meteorologists in the market, right, were hired because of this. I've always well, heard for for us now. Tom right. Wells was the first in Louisville, and he was at mm -hmm. Wave. Right. Well, I, I think it's great that all this has been preserved, and uh, of course, we're going to be doing another special coming up. It's going to be on our air in April. And we'll be sure to bring that to you. But wanted to make sure that we saw this for the first time, hour-long special from 1974. Well, Thank good you. job, Joe, finding, of course, we have it well-preserved. And every year it comes around. But this is the big one. This is 50 years right. when Louisville changed forever and uh, came together. And we still talk about it today. Well, for Joe Federley, I'm Doug Prophet. Thank you very much for watching this special presentation from WHAS 11 News, April 3rd, 1974, 50 years later.